Well, good morning. It is good to see you all this morning. We are in March now, right? We're making it into and out of the thick of winter, and so we're getting to spring hopefully here soon. If this is your first time, so glad that you are here. My name is Joel, and I would love to meet you after the service, and you have jumped into literally the middle of a 14-week series that we're going through called The Way of Change. And just to recap briefly, then we'll get into what we're talking about today. This is what we've been saying the whole series, The Way of Change is following the way of Jesus, practicing his presence in my life. When we're looking at this passage, John 15, this is where we launch from and continue to go back to. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is what we've been saying, that when you say yes to Jesus, when you are a Christ follower, the Spirit of God lives inside of you, which allows for transformation to take place in your life. We're talking through this internal change that I think each and every one of us desires, right? Each and every one of us desires this change in our life. When we're looking at this and saying, how does that take place? Or how do I usher that into my life? What does that look like? We're looking through what we call the spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines, some might call them. We said these practices that we put into play, like community, silence and solitude, fasting and feasting, right? We looked at these the last couple of weeks. Said these things are not an end of themselves. They are a means to an end. They're a means to spiritual fruit growing in my life. And as we've navigated these, we're like, how do we plug these into the rhythm of our life? How do we plug them into the rhythm of our life so they take place and they usher us into the presence of God, right? They usher us into the presence of God, which allows for transformation to take place inside of myself. And I've said this uh, multiple times before, this uh, idea of practices or putting this rhythm into our life should not be a one-size-fits-all kind of thing for each and every one of us, right? The rhythm will look different. We challenge each other to practice these things and to put them into play in our lives, but I cannot say that you, each and every one of you have to do it this way, right? And so we're figuring out how does that rhythm take place in my life so I can usher into the presence of God. And so if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, I hope this series is encouraging to you and equipping to you. I hope this is something that encourages you and you run alongside of this for the 14-week duration and say, this is something I want to put into play in my life, not just because I have to do the Christian things or do the right things, but rather I want to see transformation take place in my life. If you are someone that doesn't follow Jesus and you're here and you're kind of exploring this thing about Jesus or church, God, whatever it may be, I hope that today you get to peek into the beauty of following Jesus. I hope that's what you see out of these practices practices that you engage with, what does this look like in my life? And today we're going to go into the practice of meditation, right? Meditation. I'm excited about this one because this one is also one that we may not talk about as often, right? I get the ones that we don't talk about all the time. Fasting, just like it's feasting, I get fasting, and meditating. It's interesting. It's interesting. 8% of our nation, 8% of our nation have said or would say that they have put meditation as a part of their life. They have practiced meditation. So it is not something that we see maybe around our lives all the time. Meditation is not something that takes place uh, oftentimes maybe in our inner circles, in our communities. It's something that can be associated to kind of religious activities. What does that look like? What does that feel like? What is meditation? And oftentimes, or the picture that I get when I think of meditation is something like this right? You have meditation there, someone sitting in a meditative state. And so we go to Buddhist monks, right? We think of this picture of that's what meditation is all about. And it's interesting as you look at that picture, right? And you think about maybe that's where our minds go when we think of meditating or the practice of meditation. I looked up some of the meditative practices of Buddhist monks because I think that that is naturally what we kind of go to. And so they have different formats of what practicing meditation for them is like. The first one that they would say their practice is kind of a mindfulness practice. They have to get in a certain posture. They have to make sure that they're kind of in the right time, in the right place. They observe their breath and acknowledge their thoughts and they gain gain some clarity, and they sit upon that. That is one way they practice meditation. Another way I found was fascinating is they practice this kind of art of meditation, and they call it like loving kindness thought. 
They just think of loving things and kind things, and they kind of sit upon that meditation. And then the last one I found, kind of one that they practice, is this contemplative meditation. Right? They just kind of sit there and they think about deep questions, in a sense, or deep life questions, deep life things that are happening. And that's how they practice meditation. And so when I was researching it, it's like, wow, this is fascinating. And oftentimes, oftentimes meditation is associated to Eastern religions. Right? They're associated to Eastern religions. And basically what is being taught, okay, this is just kind of the basic foundational level. There's a lot more pieces to it, is basically empty your mind so you can be present to the moment. Empty your mind so that you can be present to what is going on in the moment. And so what this Buddhist monk is practicing is emptying the mind so I can just be present right here as I sit. I found that to be fascinating. And we're going to talk about biblical meditation and kind of the uh, maybe the back and forth or contradictory to what we think it is, right? But that is what they would practice. And what I found is fascinating is that this Eastern religious belief in the form of meditation is kind of swafting into our Western world a little bit at a time. You see celebrities and athletes starting to partake in it, right? Trainers starting to partake in meditation as a way to practice kind of getting better at whatever skill they have. I found it interesting because I was listening to a podcast. I don't know how many of you are podcast fans. I love listening to podcasts, and there's one in particular that NPR has. It's How I Built This. How I Built This, and basically it's a host, and he pulls in entrepreneurs, and he pulls in people that have built organizations like Panera and all these places and say, how did you build this thing? How did this take place? And there was one that was on there that relates to this content so, so much. It was an organization called Headspace. And basically, this organization uh, it is a business of meditation. They have an app and a website that they basically help people practice meditation, and they also help people learn about meditation, and they have stories kind of underneath of that saying, this is what it is, because we often have this view of it. And I found it interesting, okay? I'm not going to dive into all the things that that app provides, all that stuff. It's not like terrible things, but I found it interesting, the founder's story behind how he founded this to take place. His name is Andy, and I'm going to butcher his last name, Pudicom, I think is how you pronounce it. And Andy is from England. Andy, he would, when he was growing up, oftentimes or at least sometimes go with his mom to when she practiced meditation at the local gym or at the local meditative spot that they would go to. And so she would be taught these things. And he would go and kind of sit upon it and kind of stare upon it and say, okay, what's this all about? And he kind of, kind of moved on in life, got to high school, went to college. He was studying to be a sports science degree or get a sports science degree, go into that field. And Andy, about halfway through college, something tragic happened in his life, and I can't recall if he lost a loved one or a friend, but he was going through this moment of grief unlike any other. And so he's like, what do I do with this? Because all happiness, all joy, all peace was kind of sucked from his life. And yet he still is going to, he's trying to figure this thing out. He's like, what do I do with this? How do I handle this? What is going on? I'm not really sure where to go. It's just been sucked from me. And I'm not sure what my response should be. And he said, what if I go on to this meditative state or go into the practice of meditation What if that were to be my response in the midst of this? And so you see, as the story fleshes out, Andy, for 10 years straight, just travels around different countries, mainly in the Eastern world, practicing meditation. And he goes on, practices meditation, becomes a Buddhist monk himself, and eventually founds Headspace, and that is where he is at today. What I thought was interesting What I thought was interesting is how it led him to pursue meditation, where his life was at. Because I think for some of us, maybe many of us, that is where we're at today. That is the point of life that we are at today where we are just struck by this moment of where am I finding my happiness, joy, peace, and maybe it's grief, maybe it's mourning, maybe it's the loss of someone, maybe it's just life that's hit you and you're like, where in the world do I go? And you're kind of grabbing for all these things in the midst of pain and trauma and grief. You're like, what is going on? So Andy pursued this meditation practice so that he could empty his mind, empty his mind, be present to the moment, kind of get past this moment of grief. And I think, I think in this uh, society today, in our world today, we have so many different things that we can just empty our mind of. 
empty our minds with, that we don't have to face the pain and the trauma and the grief, where Andy pursued this form of meditation, and we're going to look at the biblical form of it, but I think that we run the things like entertainment, and the things like sex and relationship, we run the things like addictions, that we can just empty our pain and our trauma, empty it all so that we can just be present to whatever we can fixate on. And that's kind of where our life is at right now. For some of you are sitting there, you're like, I don't know where to find happiness, I don't know where to find joy, peace. I'm just sitting in this moment. I'm not sure where to go next. I feel like going on a journey somewhere. I just don't know what in the world to do. And I believe that today as we dive into what is biblical meditation, I think that God is going to lean in in a unique way, in a unique way to kind of answer what in the world do we do and run into as we look at biblical meditation. Because... Biblical meditation, comparative to what Buddhist monks would believe, they would say emptying your mind is meditation. We're going to look at biblical meditation, and that is filling your mind specifically with God's word. That is where the unique difference is. It's not this emptying of things and get rid of. It is filling your mind with God's word so that you can run into life. So we're going to look at what is biblical meditation. We specifically are going to look at Psalm 1. So you want to turn there. Psalm 1 is where we're going to look at. And I think it's fascinating as I think about, as I think about what we walk through in life and how we deal with pain and trauma and situations and experiences and we're like, what in the world? Where do I go from there? How do I deal with this? Where happiness has been sucked out of me, joy, peace, I'm not sure where to go. I think it's fascinating when you look at this psalm, how he tees up, the psalmist teams up tease up this conversation on where to go, and it's centered around biblical meditation, okay? So Psalm 1, Psalm 1. The psalm opens up kind of the content of the book of Psalms. There are 150, 150 chapters in the book of Psalms, and this one kind of tees up what the path is and the conversation is throughout it all. It's fascinating. Psalm 1 is a wisdom psalm. So basically what it is going to speak upon, what it's going to speak upon is kind of this pathway of godliness, pursuing a godly way of living, comparative to pursuing a wicked way of living, basically the opposite of that. And so it kind of just tees up six verses, this conversation, and as you read through scripture, you see other wisdom uh, psalms take place in Psalms, but you also see Proverbs kind of has the same conversation going on. So I'm excited to dive into this one. Let's start in verse one, okay? Verse one says this, blessed is the one. Okay, let's stop there. Blessed is the one. Blessed, okay, it's a unique word. It's maybe a church word that we use oftentimes. Don't know kind of the background of that. Blessed kind of equals the word Asher, And Asher was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Israel. And basically, Asher means, oh, the happiness, oh, the blessedness. Okay, oh, the happiness, oh, the blessedness. So this psalm launches off and starts with the main theme of the book, this idea of happiness and joy and peace. And it it brings us to this question, how do I attain happiness? How do I attain that? How do I attain happiness, right? You walk around life, right? And happiness, true, fulfilling, life-giving happiness is hard to come by oftentimes and it's hard to define, I think, oftentimes. Like, how does that feel, right? I go to Disney World, I'm kind of happy and then it's gone, right? I go to this NBA game, I'm happy. I get to see the family at some point, I'm happy. Like, then it's gone. Like, true, life-fulfilling happiness. How do I navigate that? And I think that our society and our culture, going back to what just talking about is in the midst of the happiness conundrum. I think we're in the midst of this happiness confusion where happiness is defined as devoid from suffering, pain, trauma. That if it's devoid, that's where happiness lives. If you don't have pain, if you don't have trauma, if you don't have suffering, if you don't have all these things in your life going on, then you can experience happiness. I found it fascinating. Tim Keller has a quote here. One of his books He says this, in the secular view, suffering is never seen as a meaningful part of life, but only as an interruption, right? Suffering, pain, hardship, all of those things become an interruption in our life that separates us from happiness, right? The freedom of happiness means that I'm not not wasting away on all those things that are taking my 
time. And this can feel unattainable, it can feel unrealistic, it can feel like a pipe dream. But what I thought was fascinating is the, the psalmist who is writing this starts with this concept saying, blessed is the one. And that's where he starts. Oh, the happiness, right? This is where we're going to start. And when he talks about being blessed or this understanding of blessed, it's not a deserved state, It's not something that I deserve. It's not something that I've put on myself. It's not something that I've done for myself. Rather, it's a gift from God and a gift of God. We need to know that. It's not like blessed is the one because, wow, so amazing. Look at what they've done. Look at who they are. It's a gift from God. It was interesting. I did student ministries for five years, and probably three or four years ago, we had a kid, a student come in. He was sixth, seventh grade. I love this student to death, and he was just trying to be you know, a good student, kind of follow his parents, all those things, do the right things. He would walk in, and I would ask him. His name was Joe. I'd say, hey, Joe, how are you doing? He said, I'm blessed. I'm like, you know, you chuckle a little bit. So you're like, that's awesome. How was your weekend? You go on. Every single week, I asked him, how are you doing? He said, I'm blessed. So eventually, eventually me and Pastor Greg, we kind of chuckle about it and we're like, what does he mean by that? Does he know what that means? Does he understand what that means? What is going on? Why does he say that? So the next Sunday he came in, said, hey, Joe, how are you doing? I'm blessed. I said, why are you blessed? He looked at me for a second. I don't know. And I'm like, okay, well, how was your weekend then, right? It just became a funny, silly thing. And I think that oftentimes we look at these words blessed, these church words, we read through Psalms, we're like, what does that mean? And how do I get blessed? And how does all this special things happen? And I think when we understand that it's a gift from God and it's a gift of his grace and mercy, that we get to live this life in joy and gratitude, understanding that. That is not something that I put on myself or I can make myself do or I can make myself blessed or whoa, whoa, whoa. It is gift from God. But what I also think is fascinating about this first statement, he says, blessed is the one. That he's teeing up a conversation that really points us to two ways of living and two roads of living. Either the way of righteousness, the way of God, or the way of the wicked. Right? Because as you see it go on in verse 1, he continues and he says this. Who does not walk in step with the wicked? So blessed is the one who does not step in the way of the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in, the company of mockers. And basically what he's talking about is the way you think, the way you behave, the way of your identity. He said those things are the things that so often can get pulled by the way of the wicked. The way you think and what you think about how you spend your time and what you're kind of mauling about, right? The way of your behavior and how you act out and your attitude and things of that nature. And then what you identify with and who you identify with. That is oftentimes where you can land in. What I found is interesting, he says, blessed is the one that neither walks in the way of the wicked or sits with mockers or any of those things. And yet I think we have to come to the recognition that we have all been there at one point or another, right? We have all been there at one point or another. That we have all been sitting in the way of the wicked. We've all been walking in the way of the wicked, right? And yet blessed is the one who continues no longer, who understands the grace and the mercy that God has given them. Right? As you continue, right, he starts right there. He says, that's one path. That's one path that you can lean into. Let's check out the other path. He says, blessed is the one, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. There's our word, meditate, right? Meditation. Meditate, okay, we're gonna hash this out and then I'm gonna give you two things that the psalmist is talking about that helps us lean into what meditation is all about. Okay, but understanding first what the word is about, okay? Because meditation can be kind of this weird, what does this mean? What is going on? Basically, if you drill it back into the root, meditate in its basic form means to murmur, mutter, or basically the sound of an animal, okay? So there you go. So as you meditate, think of murmuring, muttering, and being an animal and all that, right? So it's all good. But meditation for the Jewish people, right, was something they did on a daily basis, and it it was them reflecting on the Word of God. Now listen, they didn't have Bibles like we have today. They didn't have the Bible app. 
Okay, they didn't walk around with their devices, have the Bible app, or the 66 books that we have today that they're walking around reading, that literally the words that were passed down through the families, through ancestors, that they literally sat upon and they just kept reflecting and murmuring to themselves. They never wanted to forget the word of God. And so it was this practice that they just had going and going on a daily, hourly basis that they're remembering what God had said, right? They memorize and ponder. It is illustrated like this. I heard it illustrate like this. It's like a cow chewing its cud, okay? So we have a picture of a cow up here. Look at that beautiful cow, right? Look at that thing. So uh, basically meditating how you can picture it, it's like a cow chewing his cud. Now, if you know anything about cows, if you're a farmer or been on a farm or handled cows at all, right, cows eat cud, and what they do is they're eating and they're eating, and they chew on it and they chew on it and then they swallow it. And then I don't know how much time goes by, maybe an hour or two, and then they regurgitate that same cud, okay, and they keep chewing it which is just disgusting to think about. Let's be honest, right? If you think about that in your own life, you're like, if us humans did that, how awful would that be, right? But it does that, chews, it chews, swallows again. And then a couple hours, it regurgitates, and it chews and chews and chews and chews, right? And here's the image that I want you to get, okay? Meditation, in a sense, is like chewing the cud of Scripture, that literally you are sitting there in a passage and you're chewing and you're chewing and you're chewing on it in the morning and then you go to work and two hours later you <laughs> regurgitate it, right? You go back to it. You ponder on it. You reflect on it. You sit upon it, right? And then you swallow it again and then you go to lunch and you regurgitate it and you sit upon it and you ponder it. That's the image I want you to get. As disgusting as it is, you will remember that in all of its beauty. But I really want you to get that because as you think about it, what if God's word became that in my life? That was just like a cow, just chewing and chewing, regurgitating, and it repeats, right? So meditation, illustrated like that, but it brings us to two understandings. The first one is this. Meditation directs us by his word. Meditation, it directs us by his word, or his word directs us in the midst of practicing meditation. Richard Foster, Richard Foster says this, the ability to hear God's voice and obey his word, that is meditation. So the ability to hear God's voice and obey his word, that is meditation, what he says. Now, if you're a parent in the room, you know that the ability to hear one's voice and to obey can be hard, especially if a middle schooler, right? You're like, what in the world is that all about? Hearing and obeying, it can be hard to correlate even as adults. I found myself in trouble this week uh, for my lovely wife, who I, I love dearly, and uh, I got myself in trouble a little bit, okay? I'm OCD, and I like to clean things up, and when things are about done or hit an exp expiration date, I like to throw them away. And oftentimes, like when I mean often, once a week, okay, she will go to the fridge and she'll be looking for dinner for us. And earlier that week, I had thrown away whatever was for dinner because I assumed we were done with it. That happened this week. And I said, babe, you won't believe it. I'm talking about hearing and obeying this week in the sermon. And she says, you don't listen to me at all when it comes to this stuff. So that means you are not obeying at all, right? But it's funny, right? When we think about hearing and obeying, it can become a very hard thing for us. And we think about kids often. We think about all these things, right? But being directed by the word, I think, is a desire for us internally. I think as humans, we desire direction, I really think we do. I think we desire, when I worked with teenagers, I think they desire direction, yet in our pride and in our selfishness and in our ignorance, I think that we skirt past it and push it aside and say, no, 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 that's not what I'm about, right? In my ignorance, I will throw away things before I ask my wife if she needs them, right? And I think that we do that with God's word, that we can flesh out the same experience with scripture. We can look at scripture and say, that's a lot of cool stories, a lot of cool characters, a lot of maybe crazy different things that are happening, and yet we never allow it to change us. We never allowed us to sit upon it and obey the scripture of what God is allowing us into. I think hearing and obeying comes down to fellowship and relationship, I really do. I think if we're willing to lock into being directed by the word of God, it allows us to dig into our relationship with God uniquely. I really think it does. Psalm 119, the psalmist continues, 
Okay, in verse 97 to 100, he says this, oh, how I love your law, exclamation point. Like he is yelling that. He's excited about that. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers for I meditate on your statues. I have more understanding than the elders for I obey your precepts. You look at me, it provides wisdom and insight and understanding to give direction to our life. That's what he's talking about. He's like, I love your law. Look at what it provides me. Look at the commands. Look at your word, what it gives me into my life. And I think oftentimes we can view this collection of books, the Bible, it's a bunch of neat stories. I can view it on that side. It's like, that's really cool. Some neat stories, some faith stories, all that stuff. We can view it over here as a theological, like knowledge-based. I got all these things in my head and I got it figured out. And look at the terms I can use and this and that. We can lean on this side and say, it's just a bunch of rules and commands. Why do I need to read it? What's up with that, right? And yet I think the psalmist here, he's saying, listen, listen, listen. What if you just dug into it, regurgitated, and allowed you to uh, allowed it to direct your life? What if you fell in love with it so much so that you were allowing it to transform your life and direct you in the path that I want you and desire for you to be on? Can you imagine the happiness that comes from hearing and obeying this direction in your own life? Right? Can you imagine, can you imagine just digging into and meditating on Scripture to allow it to transform you internally so that when those situations, those experiences, the hardships, the sufferings, you will see direction play out in the Word of God. It's fascinating. James also speaks on this in the New Testament. James 1, through 24 says, Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I think it's a powerful illustration, maybe in an exaggeration so much so, to say, look, look, you can sit there and you can read it and yet you go away and you don't obey it. It's just like looking at the mirror in the morning and totally forgetting the second after you turn around what you look like, what your faces look like, right? He's like, can you imagine that? Can you imagine just turning and not knowing, and that's exactly what you can do with Scripture. He says, no, 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 you need to lean into Scripture and do what it says, not legalistically, as a, I got to do this, I got to fulfill this, this is what's going to get me to heaven, but as a way to follow Jesus and as a way to love your relationship with God. And he goes on to say in verse 25, I'm going to go to the next screen, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. I find it ironic that that word bless shows up in James just like it shows up in Psalms. There's a correlation to direction in my life that allows me to experience happiness, true meaning, and purpose, and fulfillment in following Jesus, right? We're going to get to what does this word bless totally mean, but I think it means that ultimately we see fruit produced out of it, right? So we see that play out. They will be blessed in what they do, but I also think it's important to see what Jesus, he was directed by the Father, Jesus was directed by the Father. We see in John 5.19, Jesus says, and gave him this answer, very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. And then John 5.30 says this, by myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. My judgment is just for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Jesus ran into his father, into a relationship with his father through silence and solitude, and he would sit upon and ask God to share his will, the father's will with him. He said, I want to do your will. I want to be directed by you. This mission that you have me on is totally you and by you and for you. Show me that. We see at the end of his life in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is wrestling with the Father in heaven. Like, not my will, but yours. I want it to play out. So we see Jesus in situations, circumstances, experience. He is chewing the cud 
per se. He's saying, I want to do your will in the midst of this. So first we see meditation. It leans us into direction by the word. But secondly, meditation delights us through his word. Meditation delights us through his word. Ultimately, we should be delighted in his word. We have a quote up here by a guy named Brother Lawrence. He's a 16th century Christian monk. Now, this quote could come across as weird and unique, okay? So bear with me as we, as we uh, read it. It's interesting what I think he says. I find myself attached to God with greater sweetness and delight than an infant suckling on his mother's breast. I have at times such delicious thoughts on God that I am ashamed to mention them, right? Have you ever felt like that when you read God's word? That's what I want to get at. As weird as that quote can come across or as unique as that can come across, right? I think he's getting to this point. He's like, I so delight in God and his word and who he is and what he's about. You can't even fathom it. I have to use this illustration to get to that point. And the thoughts I have about God, dare I even say them, I delight so much in who he is. Have you ever felt like that with your relationship with God and the word of God? I think oftentimes we can see God's word and digging into God's word as a duty and as something I have to get done and something I have to do rather than a delight. In Psalms, again, 119, we see the psalmist, he says, for I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. I just love your commands. I am so in love with what you have to say. I'm in love with your word. It brought me to this point of uh, kind of understanding duty versus delight, how does that play out? And I thought about my wedding day. I thought about my wedding day where my wife or my soon-to-be wife on my wedding day was walking down the aisle. Now, I had a treat because my wife sang to me as she walked down the aisle. I'm not even sure how in the world she got through that, but it was absolutely unreal. But as I was thinking about this point, I was thinking about my wife walking down the aisle, and in that moment, I was the one in the whole entire room, I was at the most delightful. I was, it was the happiest. I was the most joyful. I was experiencing the most delight watching her walk down the aisle. If you talk to me after the wedding and you're like, how was that experience? I was just a blubbering mess. I was so excited. I was anxious. I was having a great time watching her walk down just in all of her beauty and who she is, right? But what if you came to me after the wedding? You're like, hey, how was that experience? And I said, golly, it was such a... Such a burden to be up there to watch her walk down the aisle, right? <laughs> Such a duty to watch her walk down the aisle and like, oh my gosh, can we just get to dinner? Because I really just want to get to the reception, right? So much, that's so painful, right? Be silly and you'd be really questioning our relationship and the marriage that we're about to walk into. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that that's exactly where we may be at to that extreme. But my wonder is, as I sit upon God's word, Oftentimes, I'll sit down and I'll say, well, I guess it's something I have to do, right? It's just something I got to partake in. It's just something that's a part of the Christian walk. I'm a pastor. I have to read the Bible, right? And it's never a delight in my life, and I worry about that. I worry that God's word can be another reading assignment that we get into rather than this delightful, something I get to eat upon, something I get to be a part of, not just knowing facts about God, but knowing God through it. What if the word of God became such a delight, we preferred it over food, entertainment, and the ways of the world, right? What if it just became such a delight in us? That's where I want to be at the first thing in the morning. That's where I want to end my day at and everywhere in between. Psalm 119 also <laughs> speaks into this. It says, how sweet are your words, the psalmist says, to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The psalmist here speaks about his delight in the word. It's sweeter than honey. Like, who cares about honey? Like, look at what I get to sit upon and meditate upon and study and be a part of, right? His joy and delight coming from knowing God, coming from knowing God and what he is all about. But what I think is also fascinating in Psalm 1 is not only that delight in knowing God through meditating and being a part of Scripture, but also being known by God. As you read in Psalm 1, verse 6, continues... For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. That is how the chapter ends. And that word watches is interesting. It's interesting because basically it points us to the knowledge God has toward us. 
It's this relational knowledge. In the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for watches that they would have used is yada yada. Okay? Yada yada. Can everybody say that with me? Yada yada. Okay. Y-A-D-A, okay? And basically, this is what it means. It is a relational knowledge and experiential knowledge. It is, it is an intimate knowledge. They would have used it between a husband and wife. It would have referred to sexual intimacy. So now you will never use that flippantly, right? Don't just go around saying yada, yada. It is used as sexual intimacy that literally God is saying, I want to know you relationally. I want to have this knowledge and this relationship with you, not just you are one of the others that I created, but I want a relationship with you. Here's what's profound. I think that meditating on God's word brings delight by knowing God, and I think meditating brings delight by being known by God. There are two deep longings in our life, is to know and to be known. And our culture is trying to fill that up in so many different ways. And God's like, no, 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 come to my word. You will know me through my word, and you will know what I think about you and how I know you based on reading in my word. It's interesting. The psalmist, he continues, and I'm going to end here, okay? He says this in verse 3. We're hopping back up. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Okay, you might have saw this. I was told it isn't a tree up here, but we're going to imagine like it's a tree, okay? Let's imagine with me this is a tree, okay? Here's the thing. I find it fascinating that the psalmist kind of points to this illustrative point naturally in this passage. He's saying, blessed is the one who delights and meditates my word, they, that person is like a tree. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which I think we have a video up here just to get you into the full mode of what he's talking about here. He's saying that tree that's planted by the streams of water, it bears fruit, it produces, it thrives, right? It prospers. Not a leaf withers from it. Right? And I want you to imagine your life as this tree, per se. Right? Is your tree planted by the streams of water? I think is what he's asking. Is your tree planted by the streams of water? What's interesting about what culture and environment that he would have been speaking into is it would have been a dry and arid climate. To be planted by a stream of water would have been a huge thing for a tree. It just had constant, constant, constant water hitting its roots so it could grow and produce fruit in that season. What's interesting about what the psalmist is writing is it has, I think, direct correlation to John 15, what we are reading and studying. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branch. Remain in me. I think the psalmist, ahead of his time maybe a little bit, said, make sure you're planted by the stream of water. Remain in him. Run to him. Because here's the thing. Some of you are in a season that is dry and arid right now, and you are just withering underneath of that. You're just withering underneath of that. And you're like, what in the world is going on? How do I navigate? How do I deal with this? Where do I go with this? I think that God is leaning into this practice and saying, run into my presence. Plant yourself by the stream of water. Plant yourself in my word. Run into me. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know what you know about me and the relationship I can have with you. It's interesting. Jesus practiced meditation. We're going to look deep into it. He practices meditation In multiple passages, we see him take silence in solitude, and he runs into asking, what is your will, God, and how do I lean into that, right? He even mentions in John 5, 37 through 40, he's talking to religious leaders. He says, you study the scriptures, and yet you miss that it's about me. Like, I'm the one that gives you life, not reading the scriptures. I'm the one that this is all about. I'm the one that it's pointing to. He was telling them this and talking to them about this and leaning into that, right? That's where it's at. It's fascinating. I think biblical meditation allows us to focus on Jesus. I think it does. 
I think it allows us to focus on Jesus. And I think for some of us in this room, like I said before, maybe this Jesus thing, church thing is new to you. Maybe it's something that you've not experienced or you're just jumping into, right? And maybe meditation is not the conversation we need to have today, but saying yes to Jesus is the conversation because the tree of your life is just withering and dying. And you're like, where do I go? I don't know my meaning, my purpose. I want to know and be known. I just don't know where to seek that at, right? And I think it's fascinating. John 14 says this, and I promise we'll end. We got the nice background in the back. I love it. It's okay, Paige, if that doesn't work. Don't worry about it. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except uh, through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do not know him. You do know him and have seen him. For some of you, it's saying yes to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and life this morning. And that's where you start by planting your tree by the stream of water, saying, yes, I give you my life. I surrender my life, and I recognize my sin, and I want to say yes to you. But for others of us, we've said yes to Jesus, and yet we have not planted our tree by a stream of water, which is his word. We're like, this life I don't get, this is going on, it's craziness, and where do I go from here? And I would say, learn to practice meditation, not just because it's a Christian thing to do, not because it's this thing or that thing. Learn to sit in God's word and regurgitate it, chew it, swallow it, regurgitate it, chew it, swallow it. I would say these four things, okay? These four things. First one is this, write this down. You can practice this individually or collectively. First one is time it. We'll run through this quickly. Like silence and solitude, find a time. Okay, you have to find a time. Uh, you can't just kind of willy-nilly, we'll figure it out. Evening, morning, lunch, whatever maybe. may be, time it. Next one, read it. Okay, read God's word. Soak in his word, a gospel, a psalm, a proverb, the sermon series guides back there. Pick a passage, spend a week on it. Just continue going back to it, fleshing out all the meat that you can get from it. Read it, spend time in it, sit upon it, and ask the question, what are the implications for me, not what does this mean to me? What are the implications and the context and what the truth is that God is speaking into this? Third thing, kneel it. I don't know if this all makes sense, but I thought we'll just all end them with it, right? Kneel it, pray about it, okay? After you read, immediately pray to what God is speaking in to your life through the scripture. Spend time in prayer, and then lastly, Chew it, baby. Chew it. Just chew it all day long. Regurgitate, chew. Regurgitate, chew, right? Spend time in it. I dare you. Send me an email how that's going, how you're regurgitating scripture, right? I want you to get that image into your mind. That's how I would practice it. Find a rhythm to it. Find ways to be directed and delighted by God through his word. Can you imagine? Can you imagine as you run into circumstances and situations, how that would give life and produce fruit in your world and in your life being planted by the stream of water. Let's pray.